tired of wasting time on entertainment that doesn't bring you a sense of community? Do you feel like people are trying to force you to take a side in this silly culture war? Does your media have you feeling too conservative, too woke, too religious, too heathenous, not enough whatever, like a freak? That's because you're not a character. You're a real person. You're messy, and you don't fit into a box. Good news. We're freaks, too. Would you like to melt your stress away? Get connected to a community of other misfits? Maybe listen to the misfits? Stop feeling like a lonely outsider surrounded by people trying to enlist you in a war you want no part of. Become a contented member of a community that requires only that you live your best life and leave others to live theirs. Feel a sense of belonging while opting out of the culture war. This is Peace Freaks. All right. How is everybody doing? Welcome to yet another episode of Peace Freaks. Nikki P here as always with my lovely wife and co-host Lizzie. How you doing there, babe? Doing awesome. How are you? You know, I am doing as I do. That thing you do. Trying to squeeze squeeze this intro stuff in between work I got called in for and, you know, you know, podcasting between the day jobs been pretty hectic lately, right? As you do. You know, you're you're working holiday hours again, going crazy and Yeah. But you know, never never gonna complain about those paychecks, so Thank God for that. I'm trying to trying to reach a full time job <laughs> myself. Just like pasting together all the things. So this week we have a fun episode. We uh, sat down with uh, Mr. Aaron Harris of the Libertarian Party Muses Caucus, and more importantly, the Decentralized Revolution Podcast. Indeedy. It was a it was a fun conversation, right? Oh yeah, totally. I thought so. I mean, I may have poked some bears. But I'm, I'm, you know, as you, as you do, I do. There is no doubt that as I do refers to what I do with bears. Mm-hmm. Coincidentally, since you know I am a bear, there's that big hairy cuddly guy, right? Yep, that's I think how that usually goes. Anyways, we're gonna throw you guys a song, and then we're gonna get right into this bad boy. Heck yeah! So check out this interview with Aaron Harris. All right. How are you doing today, Mr. Aaron? Do you use all three of your names when you talk to people or you just go by Aaron? No, I don't. I use just the name Aaron. And there's a story behind why I have three names, not because I'm pretentious or anything like that, but because... Uh, you are, but that's fine too. Well, sometimes. In, in the year uh, around 2004, I was in grad school for journalism and I did a, a reporting residency with the Associated Press in Jerusalem. Oh. And so they were putting me in the, in the system so I could file stories and things like that. But AP system is like their own enclosed little system. They already had another Aaron Harris who was a reporter in, uh, not a reporter, but a photographer in Toronto of all places. So I was like, oh, just stick my middle name in there. And then uh, I just kind of kept it because it's easy to find me online that way. Mm Mm-hmm. Also, at the time, there was a college football player named Aaron Harris uh, <laughs> that kind of, you know, when you type my name in, you got a black guy who was 6'3", 280 instead of me, who's 6'3", 280. So. I, I wonder <laughs> if that's why I, that name always sounded kind of familiar to me. Hmm. Yeah, he was with Penn State. I'm not, a, I'm not a big college football fan, but I think he was pretty good about 15 years ago. Do you, do you, know, you know Daniel over Actual Anarchy? Uh, very little. I, I mean, I okay. interacted with him a little bit in the uh, Tom Wood Show Elite. Okay. And I've heard a couple of his podcasts, the movie podcast stuff he does. I've checked out a couple of those. Yeah. Because yeah, if I remember correctly, he's like, oh, I know this guy in the Tom Woods group who's actually from Ohio. Yeah. And I think at that point, you'd been kind of out of the whole politics thing for a little bit. You were dealing with other stuff. I think was yeah. The, the excuse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I, almost, <laughs> I almost died in 2017. So oh, geez. But I... I had a mystery infection and uh, that went undiagnosed. COVID-19 all the way back then. Yeah, it was, I think I was patient zero. But no, it was a, a simple, I think it was a um, a dental, some a dentist who wasn't, who didn't have clean instruments, they think. And uh, because they, they, when they tested the bacteria, when they figured out I was sick, they said it probably came through 
you know, like an oral whatever. Yeah. So um, oh, wow. I had also had surgery to, uh, you know, fairly minor surgery that year. So it could have been during that. And then I was. Uh, Stop getting chopped up, bro. We got to keep you alive. Fight the good fight. I'm totally fine now. Um, but my my liver got infected and uh, I passed oh. out septic shock and they they rescued me and got me to the hospital where I was there for three weeks. And wow. now I'm now I'm fine. My liver's back. And um, I've, I've actually ne- I've never felt better. Working on pouring wine into the liver. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, I'm uh, if I drink anything, it's bourbon uh, and I'm not too I don't go to excess on that. Uh, nice. Well, that's probably good. Man, I saw something online, actually. It was um, bourbon or no, whiskey alternative. It's like non-alcoholic whiskey. I was kind of uh, amazed that that's a thing. I mean, I don't like the taste of whiskey to begin with. I don't right? like the taste of alcohol to begin with. But at least if you're going to do it, it might as well fuck you up. Yeah, that's that's the that's the um, the tack I've always taken. It's like, I, I actually don't like beer and wine. And I like bourbon. I like the taste of it a little better. But, you know, you can get a little bit of a, a warm feeling there. And uh, Personally, I prefer psychedelics if we're going to do anything. But <laughs> I, I've never done any of that. I've, I've thought about doing that. But, You're going to uh, go hang out with Michael Heiss. I'm sure it'll happen. I, I talk to Mike every <laughs> single day, almost every single day, but we've never met in person. Well, we've met once. We met at the Dave Smith uh, Sarwark debate. Oh, wow. How much fun was that? It was it was a lot of fun. Uh, Sarwark is such an odd cat, and Dave, I've met him, so good at that type of thing that it was it was actually uncomfortable at times. Yeah, oh, we, no. I met I met Sarwark at uh, Pork, Pork Fest, Fest last right? year. Yeah. yeah, he was not my favorite person I met that weekend. Yeah, he he's weird because sometimes he's very sensible and is a very good spokesman for libertarianism. He's just, no, he's just an asshole. Yeah, he. That's all it on, is. I I don't know because some people like on. And I, I've had problems with this occasionally, uh, uh, not so much in the last few years, but, you know, everybody can kind of be a jerk on Twitter or Facebook. Sometimes you're in a bad mood and you pop off. But I think he, he, his, his stuff almost seems calculated, like, you know, calling the Mises Institute the preferred think tank of actual Nazis is, is just, why would you say that if it weren't a calculated thing to, I, t- let me tell you what I think it is. I think there's a certain number of donors to the LP who don't like the Ron Paul wing. And I think he does this to to kiss up to those donors. And so he occasionally throws one of these firebombs out there. I, yeah, no, it's, it's the Cato thing. I could be totally wrong. Yeah. No, no, it's the Cato thing. The Cato people fucking hate, hate Ron Paul and all that. Right. Um, I don't still no 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 understanding why, but eventually all those old fuckers are gonna die off, and it's not gonna make a difference. Because honestly, I, most of the new generation, other than Coppinger, doesn't give a shit. So yeah, and he's a Democrat anyways. Yeah, he's again another one of those. So we've been talking about the Mises Mises Caucus quite a bit, and there is a reason we've been talking about them. What uh, what do you hear for? What is what are you shilling that you you do? Oh, me. I'm I'm the marketing director for the Mises Caucus. Oh, nice. And uh, I do their our podcast called Decentralized Revolution. We're up to 14, episode 14 is going to go out today with guest Tom Woods. And uh, episode 15 will be out in three or four days with Jeff Dice. We've had Dave Smith and Michael Heiss. I listened to that one actually last night myself. Yeah, yeah. So it, it's going pretty good. I uh, I have a crippling sensation that when I hear my own voice, I just can't stand it. I've gotten uh-huh. used to it. I, I, I used to work in radio a little bit and um, like right now I'm totally fine. But if I hear myself when I'm not talking, um, I just think I sound horrible, but I've got a lot of compliments on the podcast and, and my, my goal is to talk as little as possible and just to get my interesting guests to say interesting things. And that's been working out. Uh, it's a dangerous cool. thing to do in the libertarian community because man, we, <laughs> we recycle the shit out of guests. I can't tell you how many times I've heard some people talk yep. over and over again. I will say, and this is probably why you get the compliments. You do tend to ask questions that I don't see a lot of other people asking. Yeah. You, when you approach the conversations, you definitely have a different tack. So I know I'm not going to get a recycled conversation like you often get. Yeah. I think that kind of comes from I uh, I was a newspaper reporter for a little while and covering stuff on a day I was basically the only news reporter at a fairly small suburban paper for about three years and a lot of times you're writing about the same topic every day mm-hmm. you know like a court case that's going on or or something like that and you have to find a new angle to it you don't sure. want to write the same exact story so I always try to go at it you know I listen to most of those other podcasts. Most? Well, 
You know how many you know how many libertarian podcasts are out there, brother? <laughs> yeah, the the big ones, and I and I dip into a lot of them. So I I, I try to I always think of well, if I was listening, what questions would I want to hear asked? Well, not the same ones that these people are obviously going to get all the time. So sure. that's pretty cool. What do you? What questions do you ask, Liz? Uh, no, honestly, I'm just distracted because I'm reading your collar and I, oh. I, I could think it's at Scotland and then I see there's a thistle on the front of it. And I'm like, holy shit, he's wearing a Scotland sweater. This is awesome. Yeah, I got a Scotland rugby jersey that I, I got in Edinburgh on my honeymoon back in 2016. The guy almost sold me a kilt oh, man. and I, I really wanted it, but it was pretty expensive. And I was like, how many times? Yeah. The authentic ones always are. Yeah. And I'm like, when am I going to wear this thing? Maybe at, I don't know, my daughter's wedding in 25 years. <laughs> right. I'm like, yeah. So I was like, I, I just bought like a jacket and this. And I went to Edinburgh University of Pennsylvania. So <laughs> more than one of my brothers in my fraternity had like full on kilts. Oh, nice. And it was just like the thing that they'd go out drinking on a weekend and they'd put their kilt on and shit like that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So, but but yeah, they were none of them were cheap. Like they were all, I think most of them were usually like in the hundred and fifty to two hundred dollar range for the ones they were getting. And I think some of them actually crept up higher than that, depending on oh yeah how ornate they were. Yeah, I can't see paying that much for a dress personally, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so is is there a reason you went to Scotland on your honeymoon? I'm a quarter Scottish, and okay. uh, only a quarter with that beard, huh? Yeah, I know. That's the the dominant. That it's my grandfather on my mother's side. Uh, his grandfather came from a town called Kirkintillic, okay. which is kind of it's closer to Glasgow. And so we actually drove over there and stayed in a castle in the country for a couple of days. And for our whole honeymoon, we went to. I wanted to go to to London and Scotland, and my wife wanted to go to Vienna. So we did all three. Oh, cool. Mm-hmm. Which was nice, but it was also kind of tiring. So by the time we got to London, we we were exhausted. But uh, it, it was. Uh, it was a lot of fun. I'm I'm an Anglophile, you know, since I was a little kid. I read Sherlock Holmes and stuff like that. So I'm, I'm a sucker for all that type of stuff. Yeah, that's that's Liz's thing. That is totally my thing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. By the way, Liz, did you actually listen to that episode Tom did this week that I told you to listen to? Uh, no, you did point it out to me. I, I heard part of it, but I haven't actually finished it. I was I was super excited just because of the subject matter. Like um, He did a C.S. Lewis. And, and uh, Tolkien, yeah. yeah. Well, if, if you actually listen to the episode, what you find out more about it is so he had, the episode was with Brad Berzer, yep. who actually released an album, and the lyrics all center around the relationship between those two people. Yeah, it's uh, awesome. unfortunately it's a prog rock album though, so I don't know if I, I can get into that or not. Oh, you can't you can't hang. I enjoyed much of it. I was not thrilled with the vocals per se. Okay. I was super stoked to see that they got the sax player from Camel on it though. That was okay. pretty dope. Well, I haven't heard it, so don't let my my quip uh, keep you from checking it out. And I probably will try to anyway because I'm a big fan of C.S. Lewis too. So. I like Prague, so yeah, <laughs> it was a doubt that I was going to like it. Here's my question about Prague. The, the thing that I don't like about it, and being a musician yourself, you, I, I get divergent opinions on this, but to me, like the Prague rock is totally, like there's not an ounce of like R&B soul in it at all. It's all, it's, it's very clinical to me. Like I went to a Rush concert once, I got a free ticket to a Rush concert, and I was kind of like, and I, you know, I, they're they got a few good songs. It depends on the artist, honestly. Yeah. It's a lot of that. And I mean, frankly, that depends on uh, very specifically which type of prog you're talking about. Yeah. Like if you're talking more classic prog, you're going to get a lot less R&B influence. The King Crimson type stuff wouldn't carry a lot of that. You'd get a little bit more of it if you get to the more mainstream stuff like the Pink Floyd. Yeah. But then if you start moving into like the more modern, like the stuff Heist listens to that's more metally prog, sometimes those guys get into some interesting stuff. Like 12 Foot Ninja is a band that I really like, mm-hmm. and they have like disco breaks and stuff in their songs. <laughs> like yeah. they, They'll do all kinds of weird dancey stuff and then break it up with just crazy heavy you know, stuff. But it's, it's a very, very specific taste if you like that and a lot of it is prog music is music for people basically music for musicians like guys to appreciate mm. right it's you you hear the musicianship and admire it and but for me uh after a little while it's basically it comes across like the the guy who goes to the guitar store and just shows off how fast he can play scales and <laughs> you ever have you ever you ever watched the movie the commitments uh yeah yeah the irish movie yeah, yeah. it has one of my favorite lines in a movie 
and that and he it's the two guys, it's the manager and the sax player. They're standing at a urinal together, and he's asking him like, "What the fuck was all that playing in there?" And he's like, "I was trying to stretch myself." He's like, "Well, you want to <laughs> stretch yourself? Use that thing in your hand." Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was because he was trying. And he was like trying to describe the difference between like a, a jazz solo and a soul solo. And you know, soul music is very corners. It's very kind of boxed in. Yeah. Whereas jazz is just free form. Ooh, look at me, look at me. But, but the, the whole idea is in basically in jazz and prog, it's guys showing off because yeah. they can. Well, I and I'm a big jazz fan. Like I love John Coltrane is probably my favorite. Mm-hmm. I love Miles and Monk and guys like that. But there is some like I, I think that a lot of the in Prague, it's it's there's no swing, there's no that that underlying rhythm to me is just so precise most of the time. And maybe yeah. it's just because I've listened, maybe I have listened to the right people. So I'm not saying I'm right. I'm just saying for me, I, I just I, it doesn't grab me. Honestly, you know who you 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 might kind of get into like some animals as leaders type stuff with like Tosin huh. Abasi because he he'll do some weird weird swingy stuff. There's a couple guys that work in a lot more of like the flamenco styles, okay. but it's one of the reasons, like, why I, I I will say that Eddie Van Halen will always be a better guitar player than uh, you know, Joe Cetriani. And it, it's not based on skill level. It's based on the fact that, yeah, Eddie was a great guitar player, but Eddie knew how to turn it off. Yeah. And he, and he knew how to make just the riff be the riff. Yeah. And, you know, he knew how to throw that three chord, three chord power chord shit in there at just the right moment to kind of bring you back to reality. It wasn't, you're not spending the entire song stretching yourself trying to like follow it it's just oh okay cool that was neat yeah well let's get back to the actual song so yeah it's it, it, you know guitar solos like like a lot of early clapton and stuff like there's a story arc to those things like he yeah he, even the longer ones uh there's a point he's not just meandering all over the place if you if you go back and look at it it's like oh there's you know it, it all makes sense and so one of my favorite modern guitar players to listen to is actually Nels Klein. Okay. Who plays with uh, Wilco? Okay. Uh, last day, but he's a he's actually primarily a free jazz guitar player. All right. And like I like his original stuff with like I think they're called the Nels Klein Singers, hmm. but it, it's very much just masturbatory guitar playing, and he does yeah. a lot of effects and noise and so, stuff like that. But then you put him in the context of Wilco, which is a very Americana, very rock and roll centered band. And like so, he he gets to do his wild and crazy shit, but he's got to do it in this very specific context. Yeah. And some of those solos that he plays when he's limited like that are just unbelievable. Um, in in particular, like if if you know if there's anyone here listening who hasn't listened to Impossible Germany by Wilco, go do it just because it's the guitar solo in that song is just one of the most amazing journeys. Everything happens at exactly the right moment, and you just you. I've never, you don't, I've never listened to a guitar solo that I feel quite as satisfied hmm. after that solo. Okay. What do you think, Liz? Is this, yeah, am, no, am I, I can agree. That was test? a particularly um, enjoyable one. I mean, and I don't really catch all the noodling. I don't know what, you know, all of they're doing, but like that one just feels so right. Well, there's, there's moments in it where like, it's got that jazz quality where you feel like, man, he's just, he's going off the rails. Like it's, it's just about to break, break out. And then. Bam, he just hits a spot and he turns it around and you're just back to that back to that simple riff that's going to bring you right back home. Yeah. Like it's, it's like you said it's it's a journey and those are those are the best. Yeah. And I think we I think music has in a lot of ways gotten away from that. And you know you know who you might get into? A prog band that I like. It's modern prog. But part of the reason I like them is because they're actually they are so R and B driven. What's what's that name that what's that band Liz? Oh, that freaking band that you and Irma keep listening to. No, no, no. It's their EP. They have an EP called "The Most Hated." It's gonna bug me. Oh, 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 man! Why can't I think of the name of that band now? That's gonna bug me. Polyphia. I know. Yes, Polyphia. And it's like I would classify them as modern guitar prog. It's like they play along with a lot of like the new modern metal bands. Okay. But I think they're almost entirely clean guitars. Yeah. Like right. it's it's super weird. Like the guys are to look at them. They're the wafiest little dorks you've ever seen in your life. Yeah, but their their music has these this weird kind of like modern R and B quality to it. Yeah, but it's all just cool guitar playing. Okay, um, really interesting backbeats and stuff like that. Yeah. because I do think so much of Prague is just all based on odd time signatures. Yeah, they're not odd time signatures so much as they are just detailed, intricate playing. Yeah. Like the way that they interweave guitars is what makes it cool. Okay. 
we have we had a guest on to uh, to talk about stuff, and then we just ended up talking about albums. I think they should listen to right. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hey, it means the world to Liz and I that you spend the time listening to us. And I'd hate to lose you to another podcast. But I simply have to tell you about my buddy Sean's podcast, The Porcupine Perspective. If you like your liberty, raw and unfiltered, with just a hint of deep, melancholic brooding, then The Porcupine Perspective is the podcast for you. They ponder big themes and real questions. This is hands down one of my favorite podcasts. So go subscribe to The Porcupine Perspective so it can be your second favorite. So. I, I, I'm I'm curious. I've uh in the past couple months, I've kind of backed away from what a lot of the stuff that I was doing at the Mises Caucus, just because I needed to kind of get my life straightened out in a few different ways. We're still working on that project, by the way. Yeah, there's <laughs> the, that. The Nick's life not being on a, in the shambles project is a, an, <laughs> an ongoing project. But there there have been some some things that I I did notice. I, there's been a lot of weird shit that's been happening over there. In particular, like I said, there's that, that whole Hudak thing. Yeah. Which I don't know that I necessarily disagree with him about Dave, but I, I tried talking to Mike about it, and Mike was very not wanting to hear anything about it. What is your take on that whole situation? I know, I know. When I did step away, I was seeing a lot more people that I don't want to associate with, kind of infiltrate or not. Let's we'll say infiltrating, but just kind of coming in because we were definitely bringing in a lot more people. And they hadn't quite, act, at least in the very acclimated to the online timbre that, that we were trying to strike. Before I respond to that, tell me what your give give, give everyone a summary of of what the Hudak thing the Hudak thing summarizes. Just the the Cliff's Notes version for those of us who aren't in the. Oh uh, well, okay. From my perspective, uh, Hudak w- went and got his ass beat on Dave Smith's podcast. I will stay to say that. Like I I agree with Hudak about borders, and I think Dave. Should have had his ass handed to him. Hudak was apparently not the guy to do that. I'll get right. that right out the fucking gate. Right. I I later had Andrew Kern on here, and we we kind of talked about it. And I was I like I left very unsatisfied listening to the response he gave to Dave because he approached it from the dumbest the, the dumbest angles possible. Like yeah, that's neither here nor there. I know uh, Hudak stepped away and was kind of involved with the Figuratarians. The big thing is that he he doesn't like. They they do get weird about the whole Stefan Molyneux thing. Right. I kind of think Molyneux is garbage too. I do too. I also don't care that Dave talks to him. That's that's weird to me. That whole it is, and it's weird because it only goes the one way. You're only yeah. not allowed to talk to alt writers. But the two things that I do think that I that I forever saw with the Mises Caucus, and it it works to its benefit in some respects. I agree with them on the hero worship thing. I think that there's an awful lot of holding up people because they have celebrity. Mm-hmm. And that's something I see. Like Ron Paul, like first you had to take it from my perspective. I didn't come in through Ron Paul. I understand why Ron Paul is who he is within the movement, but there is a certain unquestioning Ron. Everything Ron says is right thing that kind of bugged me. Yeah, I, I, I think Dave Smith sometimes gets a little. He doesn't get the pushback. I think he deserves sometimes as well. But that's where I see it. But I got the impression that that wasn't quite like the issue with Hudak. Like it went deeper than even that. So that that's what the impression I got. Like Hudak had some issues with the way that, that the group was handling people. He also, I think, saw what I saw, which was there was a lot more people that I wouldn't necessarily associate with kind of coming in. Yeah. And I, I think any in growth, you're always gonna have that and eventually you weed them out. Like the first two years I was with the group, we had those people and we'd get rid of them because they just didn't want to deal with having to be told they're idiots all the time. <laughs> right. And you know, anytime you have this many people, like we've got eleven thousand people following the Facebook page and somewhere between five and six people in our private Facebook group. 
and you know libertarians how weird they can be. So you take five thousand <laughs> libertarians, and oh, yeah. you're gonna you're gonna have some wing nuts. And uh, we try the ones who I know that our moderators uh, do a lot of work. That if somebody says something that is, um, you know, whether it's on the left, you know, support for socialism within the LP or something like that, or on the right, you know, some of the the racist tinged, but let's just say the people who are overly concerned with demographics, right? Like those yeah. types. Yeah. So we keep an eye on those people. And, you know, most of, I was telling you before, we're not bordertarians. As far as I know, most of us still believe the state should be out of uh, immigration, both in not, you know, don't subsidize it, don't prohibit it, let, you know, private people decide, like if you want to hire somebody who lives in Mexico to come work on your farm, go right ahead. I, I, and I'm speaking for just what I see. So I don't know in detail because we don't spend, we, we almost never talk about immigration. We're focused on. Yeah. Decentralization is your big thing. Right. Yeah. Decentralization, Austrian economics and reforming the LP. Yeah. So uh, we don't, we, we allow for disagreement on that. Like occasionally uh, I do our, uh, the marketing emails and the email updates for the caucus and uh, when I uh, I just had something recently about um, Hornberger versus Amash that Michael Heiss wrote saying, hey, we're going to stick with Hornberger. And we got tons of people saying, yeah, right on, good decision. I, I did get one guy who's like, I can't believe you're supporting somebody who's totally open borders. And I, so I, got, a, I got one like that on another email a few weeks ago. And I said politely to the guy, I said, uh, well, tell me how you can you know, I, I agree that there's some problems with the current immigration system. Tell me how the state can solve that without violating the non-aggression principle. Right. And his his response was, uh, "I'm not so concerned about that on this issue." What? So, yeah. Yeah. No. Exactly. So I'm like, I, I'm okay with people having a dis divergent viewpoint on that. But if you go, if you go to the point where you're saying, "I don't care about the nap on this one thing," right? Then that's kind of dangerous to me. So. As far as the Hudak thing, like he keeps trying to, apparently he's got a Fakertarian podcast. I shouldn't have even said the name of it, but he's like, oh, I want somebody in the Mises Caucus to come on and debate this. And, and we're, we're kind of over it. Yeah. Over him. The only reason I ask is because I became so peripherally involved at this at point that all this shit broke down. Like I'm, I'm just, yeah. I'm just hearing about it. I'm like, oh, what the fuck is going on here? Yeah. Well, you, you're doing the right thing. I, I do want to say that I think everybody has to take take perspective when we look at our activism and don't let it consume our lives because mm. it is it is weird and like my wife is always trying to understand she's very non political and she's like for somebody who hates politics you talk about it a lot and it's like well that's kind of the 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 catch twenty two we libertarians are in we don't want the state to control people's lives but they do but they do and so we have to push back and fight against it but if you let it get in the way of your life and your commitments yeah. to family and your your own career and your own personal well being and development then you got to step away and so um, I had already kind of done that a little bit I was involved with the Libertarian Party in Ohio pretty heavily from. Uh, 2010, all the way through early 2017. I was the state central committee chairman at one point. I'd been on the executive board most of that time and mm. been our communications director. And, uh, you know, that takes a lot out of you. And there's a lot of drama that goes on. I, I, I quit I quit talking to those people before I quit talking to the Mises people. Yeah. Just because it was like, I, I the amount of stress that it was causing in my life. Like, I just don't have time for this shit. Like, yeah. just listening to other people's petty bickering bullshit. I'm like, no, yeah, that's not for me. <laughs> yeah, you, you got to step away, sometimes permanently, sometimes uh, just for a little while to regroup. And that's why I, I got involved with the Mises Caucus is because I saw what they were doing and that they, they weren't on that sort of petty stuff. And uh, I really like uh, the fact that we're still kind of on that. Well, and I'm kind of curious because I, I I will be the first to tell you my taste for politics, like after everything that's gone down with the, the coup here, it's kind of just been sapped out of me. I don't know how I could actually personally ever care about politics ever again because while I, I love what you guys are doing and trying to do reform, I just don't ever believe that that's possible. Like it's sometimes easy to be in that position and you feel like you're making progress because you'll make like little gains within the party 
And then you look, get on, like, go into normie Facebook and you see all those fucking Karens out there. And you're yeah. like, there, there's no point in any of this. Like, we're, we're headed to tyranny. All I want to do is just find a way to launder money into Bitcoin or some shit right, yeah. <laughs> and, and run away from civilization. I, I think I, I'm generally, it's weird. Some days I'm very pessimistic. Some days I'm optimistic. Yeah. But to me, you know, lost causes are, are the only ones worth fighting for sometimes. Yeah. Right? You know, mm-hmm. like, if nobody else is going to stand up for what's right on this, then I'm I'm going to, and if this is the the hill I die on, and if we never make, let's see, old Ron Paul, the remnant yeah. thing. He's like, I'm just trying to be here for the people that are willing to hear the message, right? And I think there is a there is an opportunity, though. I think the Republican Party is dying, like literally, they're getting old. The demographics are are changing such that. Well, I mean, the coup is also killing most of the Republican Party at this point because that that entire generation is going to go away. <laughs> If it's as bad as they say it is, which I don't. Well, like, we don't need uh, to get into but, that. We we all wink, wink. Yeah. We know what we're talking about. <laughs> yeah, that's fun. So I think there is going to be, if you look at American history, you know, there's always two parties yeah. uh, who dominate things. And there's been four or five of these big, huge realignments in history and uh, where, you know, the Whig Party goes away and the Republicans take over. Well, I think the Republicans are in that in the same They The Whigs kind of lost their reason for being and uh, they they folded. And I think the Republicans are really in that are right there on that precipice because so much of their, and I, and I come from the right. I came, I was a Rush Limbaugh kid and as a teenager and through listening to Rush Limbaugh uh, and some of his guest hosts like Walter Williams, that's how I became a libertarian and went mm-hmm. far beyond that. Mm-hmm. You crazy righties. Well, yeah, yeah. But that, so those people, that outlook, the, even the conservative, and I'm a, I'm a Christian too, a fairly mm-hmm. conservative one. Even conservative Christians don't really care about gay marriage these days. You know, those of us, you know, under 40. Yeah. Yeah, no, for yeah. sure. So the the Republican Party, those cultural things, that's not going to be the driver of. You don't see the same thing happening to the Democratic Party right now, because I mean, there's a pretty big schism between the the actual socialists and like the the old timers. I yep. I'm curious to see how that's going to fight out, because the fact of the matter is, is that all those people that are still voting for like the classic Democrat, yep. they're doing the same thing the old heads in the Republican Party are. I yeah. I agree. And maybe is it is are, are we just are we seeing like the parties dying or are we seeing the generational shift in the parties and it's it hasn't quite flipped yet but we're 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 coming up on that. Cuz I mean millennials still largely don't vote. Right. But we're all coming into that age where we're going to start. Yeah. Yeah. And that terrifies me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think three things can happen. One is somehow the Republicans and Democrats solve their problems and rebrand themselves and hold on to roughly the same, you know, roughly equal slices, you know, of the electorate. You know, the Republicans hold on to a third, the Democrats hold on to a third, but, or one of the parties is going to die and be replaced. And so I see either the scenario of the Republican Party dying and a more libertarian party than, than the Republicans mm-hmm. taking that vacuum, mm-hmm. uh, or I think just as likely is for the Republicans to die. And if the socialists and that wing of things are are better organized than than our side of things hmm. then i could see 15 years from now there being a, a like a social democrat party and the democrat and at that point yeah so so my 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 thinking is always we we have to have the messaging we have to have the philosophical framework we have to have that remnant and in times of crisis and realignment there's there's opportunity there and if we're not ready yeah like i always look at the bolshevik revolution there there's a few hundred guys who had a, a very compelling idea a very wrong idea yeah. Um, yeah but they were there at the right time when historical shifts were were happening and and we know what happened there so i, I i'm more of waiting for opportunities rather than expecting incremental growth every year and at some point we'll get to 30 percent in the presidential race i don't i think it's going to go from five percent to to 40 percent if it happens if it happens it's just going to be we 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 change as as a people yeah yeah so i saw i'm curious what your opinion is on this yeah i I saw this meme yesterday matt bergman from punk rock libertarians saved it and to me like i don't even remember what the hell it said but it was a this guy holding on a slice of pizza and the pizza was covered in like basically what's that that vegetable medley like oh jeez green beans carrots and yeah. corn or whatever yeah on pizza it looks absolutely disgusting right 
But as I'm sitting there staring at it, like it, it struck me that it was like the best metaphor for libertarianism to me. Hmm. Because it's like you have this thing that's like, hey, look at me. I'm cool. I'm the thing that you want. Right. But when you, you look at it, you take a bite out of it. You're like, oh, no, that's not right. And really, it's something that you need instead. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and. And no matter how much it wants to be the cool thing that you want, it's still a bunch of fucking vegetables stuffed inside it. You know, it's right. Yeah. Yeah. There's are lots of people who serve the function of being those gross vegetables in our movement. And they come from all all parts of the spectrum. And sometimes I think it's just particular personalities who like who Mike Shipley? Well, <laughs> yeah. I'm just fucking with you. Eric. I feel about I feel about him the same way I feel about Joe Biden. Like like, you know, that's I'm a little um, I don't want to, I feel like I'm picking on him if I point out some, some things going on there. I think I've actually talked to him once. It was, I felt like it was a beating. Yeah. So my, my thing is, is to try to have positive energy and build a good culture and to try to not, you know, certain people like, you know, say, let's say the libertarian socialists, uh, uh, I'm not going to name anybody in particular, but somebody like that who wants to be in the party. Uh, pushing an idea that is you know, in direct contravention to the core beliefs of the party, you can't argue with them. Mm-hmm. You, you're not going to get anywhere except being pulled down into the mud. And so you just have to change the subject and talk about you know what you're trying to do. Talk about positive things. And if they don't, if you don't give them sunlight and air, they they might not survive. They may drift away. And so I think that's a much more humane and, li- and libertarian way of, of, you know, vote with your feet, you know, who, which podcast do you listen to? Which conversations do you get into? Uh, which causes you support? Don't focus on defeating the bad ones. Build up the good ones. Yeah. Interesting. What do you think? What are you thinking over there, Liz? I'm just writing notes so like I can I can condense like those points into the show notes because I think that's a really good point. Like the stuff that you put your energy into does tend to to grow. So you can put it in a good place, then yeah, maybe that'll grow. Yeah. How's it going? This is Nikki P, and I wanted to thank you for stopping by our neck of the woods. I sure hope you enjoyed listening to Peace Freaks as much as we enjoy making it. Now, as much fun as it is right now, I know it can be a lot more fun, and the way to make it more fun is to grow that community. Community. Unfortunately for us, growing anything organically on the internet is a thing of the past. And as much as I'd like to dump Irma's college fund into growing the show, that would make me a bad parent. So if you want to help create a bigger, more badass community, stop by UpgradeTheShow.com. We have monthly and yearly fiat options and one-time and yearly crypto options. But don't go thinking an upgraded community is all you're going to get. All patrons of the show get access to the Freedom Choir, chock full of bonus shows, and our Zoom link to watch our interviews live. So head over to UpgradeTheShow.com and help us upgrade this freaky little community. Uh, LP business aside, how much time have you been spending in a garden in the past couple weeks? <laughs> in a garden? Um, I am the least outdoors person. Oh, I, I, really? Yeah. Uh, it's, been, it's been nice knowing you, Aaron. Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't see you surviving all this. <laughs> <laughs> That's what they say. But no, I'm... Uh, waiting, waiting for all the meat to go away in a month, and then we'll see what we're all doing. Yeah, we'll see. I, I've actually got my own, uh, I, I got a source of farm nearby here, so. Okay, so okay, you get okay. that. Yeah, he's got a hookup, it's fine. Yeah, we got the grass-fed, uh, uh, you know, CSA, you know, share. That's how I feel about guns. <laughs> I got, I've, got, I've got a guy. Yeah. Yeah, but no, I, I my, my mom, my, my parents do a lot of that, but the, the gene just, my grandfather, the one who's got the Scottish heritage, always had like a huge garden in his backyard, and I just, I it just, that gene is gone in me. I wonder, I wonder what Anthony's got over there in Scotland. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Does Anthony got some property? Oh, I don't know. I don't know what I what kind of life does that guy lead, I wonder. I, I'm going to be honest, <laughs> from from our conversations, I assume that he is an apartment dweller. I just get that impression, especially since, as he put it, he's he's kind of posh. Yeah, he, it's a... He, well, a flat dweller, but yeah. Yeah, 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 right. Well, because I, I once asked him, because I, I, I was... Take a lift up to the flat. I was listening to the show and I was like, so I've, I've noticed that you and your dude have very, very distinctly different Scottish accents. Oh, yeah. And and I asked him, like, so what, what is that? I mean, am I, am I just hearing it wrong or something? He's like, no, 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 that's exactly... He's like, he has more of a 
lower class. Yeah, yeah. And, and did I have more of a posh accent? There you go. Yeah. That's the thing about the UK. Like, they're so, like, there's all these layers that the social people... stratification to just know, like, they just accept it for what it is. Yeah. And it's just there. It's so funny. Yeah. It's geography and where you are on the, the economic. They're very class conscious over there. Yeah. And that, you know, that's a, a lot of people don't like that about being British is that no matter where you go, as soon as you open your mouth, people think they know who you are um, because, oh, well, you're, you know. I mean, you start spitting Cockney and. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, but like Idris Elba is technically a Cockney, right? Oh, I know. It's so yeah. freaking funny if you ever hear him in an interview. I mean, he's yeah. not American. What? Yeah, well, I thought he was American when I was watching The Wire for the first three years. Uh, <laughs> but then I found out he's British. But yeah. What did we watch him in the other day? He was in Pacific Rim. Oh, uh, yeah. We watched him. In, and he has a British accent kind of in that one. But okay. yeah, it, he does put on the posh accent when he's acting. And then you hear him yeah. in an interview and he's totally just like, you know, shooting from the hip. It's hilarious. I've never seen this. I'll have to look at an interview. I, I, oh, yeah. No, no. The gravitas is, is not quite the, there. I don't know that I'll ever be able to look at him the same after after what he said the other day on that video about human beings being a virus and oh, Mother Nature's taking back the earth. And that's just that's what the coup is. Uh, there's way yeah. too much of that going around. I swear. That's depressing. So you, I know you are a big environmental guy. Do you guys, do you guys garden a lot? Uh, we're getting more into it. Yeah, okay. I, I was kind of always a nerd about it, but you know, didn't really throw a lot of energy into it because we live in the city. Right. And but yeah, no, we're we're definitely taking more steps in that direction right now. Just you know, for food security and the the skills. Those are good skills to have. I've been setting up netting, greenhousing in the backyard oh, cool. for weeks now to try and handle it. Yeah. I forget. Are you guys Cleveland or Akron or I forget? Cleveland. Okay. Yeah, West yeah. Park. Okay, cool. Cop yeah. Town. Yeah. <laughs> I, you think it's, do you ever get, I, I get it a lot when I'm out. We go to California a lot because my wife has family out there. Oh, geez. And people assume I'm from Dayton that I love Cleveland sports and LeBron James. <laughs> and, and I'm like, yeah. Dayton is basically has as much to do with Cleveland as it does Baltimore. It, it's yeah. two totally different. Well, I don't get that much. Number one, because I fucking hate sports in general. Okay. So they're like, oh, okay. No, no, mind you, the, the, the irony of this being, I'm one of the few people I know personally who had an athletic scholarship in right. oh, wow. college. Uh, I was a long distance runner when I was doing that. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, and obviously that's amusing if you're looking at how portly I am now that I went to school on a long distance running scholarship. But I also, I grew up in New York State, went to college in Pennsylvania, was born in Florida. So like I didn't, I've only lived here for what, six or seven or eight years now. Okay. Yeah, something like that. So I'm a transplant. I like Ohio. Like it's been been very good to me since I moved here. You like it more than I I do, and I lived here longer. Well, but you know, the thing is, uh, you, you may have a little bit more perspective on it, but having lived a few different places as an adult, I can tell you that they're all the fucking same for the most part. Yeah, that's probably true. doesn't matter where you go, the bullshit you carry with you follows you there, too. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so it's like you true. you kind of learn to make make out of what this you have as a situation, what you have out of it. My issues with Cleveland now are just standard, like... <sighs> There's too many people around me that don't have the same political views that I uphold, and right. that that concerns me if things ever really do get bad. That's my only issues with Cleveland at this point. You, you want to be around people that have like the storm shelter and the the cans of you know stuff put up in the in the cellar just in case. Are you are you a city guy there, Aaron? Or yeah, you know? we my wife and I we live in inside the city limits of Dayton in one of the few sort of nice neighborhoods that, that still exist in Dayton. Right on. Um, we live a, in a little neighborhood called Patterson Park, and it's right next to Oakwood, which is, I think, one of the richest uh, little towns in, in Ohio. It's like, uh, what was it, Shaker Heights up there? Up that way? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel you. It's kind of like that. So, like, on one side, we have Oakwood, and on the other side, we have a, a much more working class neighborhood. But we have a little a little yard, and we actually have room for a garden. And I was actually thinking of maybe trying to just put some tomatoes out there or something. So uh, I think my my parents, uh, they've got all the, they've got a little tiller and all that. So we might. Oh, gross. Don't do that shit, Bryce. You're already fucking up. What? <laughs> I, okay. See, I don't, I, I yeah, I, I'm totally lost then. Yeah. You're, th you're thinking like people, like the people that destroyed the earth, like those people, the fucking Monsanto people. Okay. So. Well, I mean, let's, let's face it. Like a lot more of that information is out there, but yeah. the, the theory is that the, the microbial life that's in your soil, that that's doing the good stuff 
is most likely going to get killed if it's exposed to like air and sunlight and shit if you till everything up. So ideally you're going to cover it and that'll kill off the grass. So you just scoop out a little bit, put the seeds in and then cover it. Um, Honestly, so what are right right now? What Liz has got, she's actually got cardboard and leaves and then leaves and then we're going to do soil. And then you just put the plants into that and the roots will work their way down underneath the cardboard. But in the meantime, the cardboard's going to kill off your grass and your weeds and shit so they don't have to compete. Oh, okay. And then it'll break down and it'll just start feeding the yeah, soil. The idea is um, there were no tillers before people and shit grew just fine. <laughs> yeah. So the yeah. it's one of those things that human beings kind of, I think they brought to make the work easier of putting the plants in the ground, but when they do it, they kind of fuck things up more because all the good shit that's inside there, like the fungi and the mycelium, it's pulled up. It's one of those things that until you can get into like the modern scientific gardening now like we do, you would have had no fucking idea about that shit. Yeah. But now that we do, like, it's it's something to, to think about because you will, you'll actually get better yields doing less to a degree. Okay. All right. Liz is looking like... What? Quit pretending like you know what you're talking about, Nick. No, no, no. It's fine. I mean, like, it's... it. I No, I feel bad saying, like, to anybody you have to do things this way just because like people everybody's coming from different spots but you know i'll put the theory out there and you know i I think also the tilling came up because they were doing monocrops and stuff so if you can you know plant some dill or something with those tomatoes whatever works with tomatoes i don't know you have to look it up right but it'll kind of keep the bugs you know there's there's things that you can plant with them that'll keep the bugs off them or distract the bugs or whatever Mm -hmm. so so, Liz, are you a musician, too? Uh, no. No, okay. I'm not. I'm just going right. to say that now. Yep, <laughs> I do like fine. music. But... Uh, just for the record, I was curious how she was going to answer that. Cause technically... I know, because I used to say, you know, I want to be or I, I you know, learned how to play guitar or whatever. But, like, we met last time I played mic. before we, we had a kid, okay? So, you know, when I'm actually playing again, then I'll be a musician. It's not so really. You, you performed it. You were performing in an open mic when, when you guys met. Yeah, yeah. I was okay. uh I wanted to sing and I wanted someone to play for me, so I asked Nick and uh oh, that's great. how we met. And then eventually I was like, I wanna bang this black chick and <laughs> Right. You know, and, and as eventually you do. annoyed her enough until she asked me out. Right. My uh my wife and I have a hard time on the music front because she uh she's a classically trained pianist and oh, wow. and and so she'll be playing on we actually have a, a little uh I think it's a Steinway. It's not. A, it's a little spinet one. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, from like the early fifties, it's still got the ivory keys. So she she'll be playing Mozart there, and and I play. You know, I'll be upstairs playing a John Lee Hooker riff on my electric guitar, and I I can't read music. You posted a nice guitar the other day, by the way. I like that that guitar you you had a, or <laughs> showing. Yeah, yeah. That was uh, I bought that with my Trump bucks. Oh. Um, I got a, uh, it's an Epiphone Masterbuilt Olympic Century. Okay. And it's basically the modern version. Do you guys know Gillian Welch? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I, I do. So uh, David Rawlings, the, her guitar player, um, plays a 1935 Epiphone, Epiphone Olympic, and he's one of my favorite guitar players. And so they came out with this uh, kind of an updated version of it a couple of years ago, and it's not that expensive. So I've been fooling around with that here last few days how's it how's it sound it, it sounds great it, it's uh really it's it's nice and loud for what it is it's an arch top uh so it's got just kind of a, a warmer sound in some ways and the and the when you play like little lead notes on it like flat picking or something like that those especially in kind of the mid-range compared to other guitars the mid-range it's it's nice and loud and chunky so cool I know. I'm sorry. I got you off track there. I was just. I. I liked it. <laughs> I'm. No. I'm very picky about my guitars. What's your <laughs> What's your main your daily driver guitar? Uh, this Yamaha is sitting next to me. Okay. Let's see it. Can you show it? It's my A1M acoustic. Okay. Uh, it's a. It, it's it does work. Yep. I mean, I've been I've been performing professionally with it for as long as I've known Liz. So the, the same guitar or the or different same guitar. Okay, that's good. Yeah, I uh, was checking out some of your music on I think your personal page not too long ago, and I, I really dug the the cover you guys did of uh, "Wish You Were Here." Uh, that was really good. Back when I was in my prog band. <laughs> oh, was that a prog band? Yeah, yeah. So, Prob- probably. Yeah, but no, I, I enjoyed that. So uh, that was a heck of a show. Was it? Yeah. I don't remember when "Wish You Were Here" when we did it. 
That was on the beach. Was that the one we played at the beach? Yeah. Man. Oh. What What was the name of that band? Uh, uh, the Hot City Symphony. Yeah. Okay. It's a reference to an Alex something. What's his name? I don't remember. I can't help you out there. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I I was deep. Jones Jones Alex Jones. No, that'd be fun. <laughs> that would be funny. I'm totally make a band centered around Alex Jones. You'd make millions. Oh, good god. Something about gay frogs as a title for a song or an album. That's got to exist, right? Somebody is, has to have Oh, I'm that. sure. I, I'm sure I have a buddy who has a band called Frodo and the Fellowship that has songs about Lord of the Rings shit. Oh, God, I love that. They're, they're a ridiculous punk band. And they had like songs like Carried by Eagles and Living the, on the... Something about the Elven Bread. Yeah, yeah, Living yeah. on the Elven Bread. Whoa. <laughs> like they're, they're ridiculous. It was fun, though. Oh, <sighs> God. I feel like there was one more thing that I was really curious about, and now it's slipping my mind because I, I got talking about music instead. <laughs> Sorry. It happens. It happens. It does happen. Was it politics or gardening? No, it wasn't gardening. No. Was it, was it about kids? Was it about the Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? No, but that's pretty cool. Yeah. That's, good, yeah. that's, got a, that's a great soundtrack. Yeah. It is, yeah. yeah. I don't know. It may, may be lost. There you go. Something about how how I guess how is this? How have you enjoyed you know the podcasting thing so far? Um, I, I'm enjoying it more and more now because I'm getting better at the editing. I don't have to do a whole lot of editing, but it still kind of takes time to put the put the audio version together. Because typically I do a little segment, just me, kind of if there's any Mises Caucus news at the beginning. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't do video for that. Uh, I just have the logo up and then I do video with the the guest and we do long form interviews. So it's usually about an hour. Mm-hmm. And then I just do a little tack on at the end. Hey, thanks for listening. So I gotten, I've gotten good at turning those out quickly and not screwing up and writing the copy for it uh, instead of just trying to wing it. And I, I think it's sounding better. Uh, at first I was like, holy crap. When the first couple I put out, I was like, oh, wow, they weren't that bad, man. I, I listened to them. Yeah. Well, I appreciate that, but like, so when you're doing that, you hear all the uh, the ums and ahs and all the mistakes and stuff like that. So I've I've really cut down on a lot of those because when I talk normally, I'm all over the place and I do a lot of um and ah and and then I, yeah, I just cut them out. Yeah, I, I I do some of those. It's time consuming, but yeah, I, I've gotten better at doing it because I used to be. Uh, I did a little radio news a long time ago, and actually, at one point, the O Brother poster there. I hosted a, a bluegrass radio show every Saturday night on oh, man. Uh, WYSO in Yellow Springs, Ohio. I did that for about four years, and uh, so I got pretty good at that of, of of being a pretty good presenter. But that was like uh, in that was almost twenty years ago at this point. So I think I remember what it was. I think I was going to ask you. So where exactly is Dayton? Is that the one that's like really far south? South and west, right? It's it's in the southwest quadrant of Ohio, and it's about uh, it's about fifty miles, give or take, north, almost directly north of Cincinnati. Okay. Okay, and then that's like Toledo is the one that's uh, up northwest, right? Yeah, up, up by Detroit. So it's an hour to the east by car to Columbus from where I am, and an okay. hour to the south to Cincinnati. Okay. okay. Yeah. Have a united state of mind and fight corruption. This time the bus didn't show who really run this. Take back our country and overthrow the government. From the artificial inflation and the valuation of our bucks to the overregulation, police state, and of course the war on drugs. Bombing of foreign nations, mass incarceration, rank number one. And the more power we give to these thugs, the more abusive and corrupt. Most folks don't think it's sold. That those in control can turn on its own. You've been sold. The bill of goods for show. Well, no, to the plan unfolds. The goal to implement slow. Just so you would do what you're told. Then they got you in a situation that you can't resist and get away from the imminent blows. It's been decades in the making, forsaken the constitutional role. While they placate the complacent by mission me propaganda info. To lead us straight from the dangerous dictating the policies they impose. So they maintain domination and saving the lobbying status quo. It's time to vacate the inundating hate. <laughs>
Do you like your libertarian podcast host leather clad on a motorcycle running from Nazis in black and white? I'm sure my friend Eric in no way resembles that at all. But his Rebel with a Cause podcast is guaranteed to bring you that same rebellious spirit. Bringing in guests from all over the political wheel. Bringing with it his own personal blend of irreverence and dare I say it down home charm. So head on over to the Rebel with a Cause podcast and begin your own rebellion against bad podcasts. I've been staring at maps of Ohio because like I'm, I've once all this happened, I was like, OK, so where could you be in Ohio, but like not be near people and like have some acres? And like there's not a lot of space up by where we are. But oh. you start going south and there's more like open farmland. Yeah. Liz, if we're doing if we're doing that move, we're moving into the we're moving into the fucking snow. Yeah, yeah, I know. Which is why we've been here, because well, most of Ohio, Ohio is eighty-eight counties, and most of them are pretty rural yeah. and pretty small. But uh, you're probably in the the most heavily uh, densely populated part of the state. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I noticed. Yeah, yeah. So where are you from originally? You, each of you. Well, you want to go first, Nick, or I'll go. Okay. Um, I grew up in Texas, but my family was military, so we were in Germany for a minute. Oh, okay. We were in Ohio, um, Oklahoma for a minute. But yeah, I remember Texas and then here. Fort Worth, right? Fort Worth, yeah. Yeah, like I said, I just grew up in New York State. Okay. Yeah. I grew up in I grew up in the red parts of New York State. <laughs> all right, all right. Which is which is why I was a Jimmy Dore lefty for most of my life. Okay. Yeah. I, I did not come here from the, the world of neocons. So yeah, but to get back to your podcasting question, I, I actually am enjoying it pretty well. I'm trying to I've I've had a lot of the the good big name libertarian guests on so far, but I'm, I've been really impressed with who you've had on. I'm assuming being buddies of Mike doesn't hurt. Yeah. Mike Heiss <laughs> has the, the figurative Rolodex. He's got everybody in his phone. And so that's uh, trickled over to me a little bit. So you've also had that, uh, that beautiful thing that everyone's sitting at home with nothing to do. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's been perfect. Like I'm sure that's how we got Dave Smith and Tom and everybody like yeah. that pretty, pretty easily. Uh, I was like, yeah, when do you want to do it? Uh, rather than uh, maybe in four weeks, you know? So, yeah, um, I'm going to have, uh, um, I'm going to have prof CJ of dangerous history podcast. You know, that guy. Oh yeah. That's awesome. Oh, uh, you, you're talking to the wrong guy about, do I know them? Yeah. I love that podcast. It's I'm a history oh, okay. nerd. So, yeah. So we're going to tape one here. It's a couple of weeks out, but I'm, I'm really going to try to get some more. What are you covering with him? I'm curious. I'm thinking about a few different things. Uh, what would you suggest? What would you like to talk about? I know. Well, no, I'm just, I was just, just curious because there's so much that you can do. What you need to do, though, is remind him he needs to finish his Woodrow Wilson series. Oh, yeah. Because <laughs> I'm fucking waiting with bated breath. For the last part or two of that. <laughs> yeah. So I actually, one thing I think I might do is uh, to kind of kick off the discussion is I, I'm always fascinated. My, my undergrad degree is in political science. I've got a okay. master's in journalism and I'm a, but I've always been a big history guy too. I love reading history. And I, I asked Tom Woods the same question and he basically said, well, let me give the question first is how do you know when you're reading a history book? Well, if the author is full of it, or not, right? Like okay. The difference between, you know, something Tom might have done, like his history of the, the, the his book, The Church and the Market, which, you know, very rigorous, very lots of sources, et cetera. And it happens to agree with my view of the world. But like, I'm always fascinated. I'm going to, I want to ask him about like Howard Zinn, you know, that people's history of the United States. I read that book and I like a lot of stuff in there, but I, don't know if it's all true. And if the, if, does he have the facts wrong? Does he, cause I hear a lot of criticism about it. Is he being too reliant on kind of the Marxist looking at things to, 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 to come to his conclusions? So I, I wanted to talk to CJ maybe about how, how do you know as a reader, whether or not to credit a particular historian? Now we know people like, like Tom answered this by saying, you know, people like Doris Kearns Goodwin, they, they write history mm -hmm. that the same as the, the, the court hist the court historians would write back in 300 years ago, just these complimentary things to the people in power. Yeah. So yeah. those people are pretty hard to, pretty easy to spot their motivations, but other people who may not be, uh, have a, a, what we would consider a solid libertarian view of things like Ralph Rako is a great libertarian historian, but how does a, how do you judge with those people in the middle who, uh, are they doing good work? What can we, 
what can we take from that and know confidently that is true? And what do we have to be skeptical about? Well, if CJ is worth his salt, what he's going to tell you to do is go and sign up for the uh, School Sucks University is what he's calling it. That's oh, right. that's good. I'll definitely check into that. Well, so all the people he has speaking, you have uh, Patterson, you've got uh, Malice, Woods, CJ Kilmer. Like they're all the people that spoke at this thing. So this uh, virtual summit, as it was called. Did you mean Jordan Peterson? You said Patterson. No, no. That, that guy from, I believe, Patterson in Pursuit. Okay. I'll have to look him up too. I, I know yeah, he's been on Tom's show at least once. Okay. I don't particularly like him, but he uh, he's a thinker at least. Okay. And a lot of other people do like him. Okay. Like people that I respect like him. So we, I'll give him the, right. not my thing, but people like it. Yeah. But I mean, you, Michael Malice and Tom Woods and CJ teaching you kind of how to do the things that they've learned how to do over the years like that that alone screams gold mine okay mm. i gotta get fucking brett to give me some kind of uh you know some kind of thing to sending people there <laughs> yeah give me a kickback because i can't afford it brett so like <laughs> if i could get enough people to sign up maybe i could get him to give it to me for free there there you go how, how many how many people do i have to get to sign up before i can access it i think it is really interesting to talk to historians especially right now because you know on the one hand like the situation with you know the thing that shall not be named Voldemort is like new and whatever but on the other hand like Sauron you know there there are historical things that you could look at as far as like depressions and plagues and you know etc and etc that you know talking to a historian would probably be really really useful honestly that episode that you're talking about specifically right there was actually the last episode with CJ on the school sucks project okay because he specifically talked about like what he was doing in this and kind of covered a little bit of the history of why he was doing the things he was doing. <laughs> Speaking of podcasts, um, how have you, what have you had success with in promoting? You know, you do the work, you get it out there. How do you get more people to listen? Well, uh, that's why I'm working on that whole Liberpods project because yep. <laughs> I want to rate. I will, well, the big thing that I've come across is like, so the, the story I always come back to is, have you ever heard of the Friends Against Government podcast? That was a podcast for an entire year before I ever even knew it existed. Right. And so when I when I saw that, I'm like, how the hell? Like, it's not like we're a big group of people. There's right. th there's not that many libertarians out there as it is. And then what you find out is, oh, we're throttled to shit. The internet does not want us finding each other oh, at all. Absolutely, yeah. I, I found that... It's amazing, yeah. How, how, how bad Facebook throttles stuff, yeah. So I, I took a mission to actually start going out and finding every libertarian podcast I could. Like I think, I think my, my list, I think, is somewhere up over 150 to 160 podcasts, specifically libertarian, ANCAP, agorist. There's more of than that, I'm sure. But right. that's that's what I found of my own volition. Occasionally, new ones pop up, and you'll you, you go and talk to those people. But one of the things is like I I like say I have a friend who has a podcast, and his podcast is fantastic. And if I told you how many people he has listening to his podcast, he's been doing it for over a year. Right. You would feel fucking awful. And it's not because the podcast right. isn't good. The content's great. The issue is that they try so hard to keep us from seeing each other. So the idea is that we really need to start advertising for each other. Right. You know, but there has to be some way to incentivize that. I, I live, go to liberpods.com if you want to find out how to incentivize your, your podcast. I actually have a deal I'm running right now for specifically because of what we're going on. But the idea being like we until we start proselytizing for each other in like a meaningful way a lot of it has to do is like so if you ever have you ever looked in advertising your podcast uh we're we're just now starting to do that you know how if you well how much money that costs how, tell me what what your well i mean have you see if you get seen any of the numbers that you get back from people like if if a place that's worth having it we'll just say to like to like advertise on another podcast yeah okay no i don't know so what was it cost like like 500 bucks a spot or something like that? or Well, it, dep it depends on where you go with it. Depends on who, yeah. Yeah. I think with Lions of Liberty, I think you get, you get like a single spot for 100 bucks. Right. Now, that's one spot that's going to be mentioned once and people are probably going to skip over it. I mean, right. those dudes are really cool. I will give them that. No, this, this has nothing to do with them. This is just the economics of it. Yeah. But the fact of the matter is, people only think about advertising with the large pods. But there's 150 other pods out there that if they could make any money, they'd be ecstatic. Right. Like if, if you use a podcast or I told you, hey, I can get you 10 bucks a month if you, you host four 30 second spots. Right. That's that's better than you were making before, isn't it? Yeah. Like that'll yep. help offset some of your hosting. Like, hell yeah, let's do that. Yeah. But that doesn't that's never existed before. So I wanted to try and create a 
an advertising scheme or basically an advertising uh, economy specifically for small podcasts so that they could go out there and do it. And essentially the way I'm working right now is you'll trade spots for spots. Like you will have, if you want to get four spots on, on other podcasts, you just accept that you'll have four spots on yours. If you want to have eight spots, you can run eight, eight, you know, spots on your podcast. Each one will be about 30 seconds. And, you know, people might, might skip over them, but people might hear them. The fact of the matter is, is that every podcast that you get out, you have a chance to be heard by someone else who otherwise would not know you exist. And it's, it's, the only, it's, it's the only way I can see to legitimately break out of the echo chamber without breaking the bank. Right. Yeah, that's a great idea. I, uh, I sent you mine for, for decentralized revolutions. So. Yep. I, I'm, I, right now I'm working on getting more people involved in it. Uh, okay. I, like last week, as it turns out, I actually worked a full-time job, so okay. <laughs> which it was, has not been the norm. But every, we, go and we went into all this, and I actually worked more than I had been working before. So. Yeah. So what do you talk about your day job on on here or no? I have, yeah, it's whatever. Specifically, what I work on is touch tunes, jukeboxes. All right, cool. But like, yeah, like I said, when all, every bar in your state is closed, uh, yep. there's not much right. I can do. So, uh, do you, what do you what do you do uh, when you're not being politically active? Yeah, I uh, am a freelance. I'm a freelance writer and editor. Uh, most of what's paying the bills right now is I uh, uh, I edit a lot of textbooks and educational materials. Okay. And that's that's fun. I like to like to do that. I'm kind of trying to write some of my own stuff as well. And I've actually gotten to work with uh, uh, Scott Horton a little bit. I helped him edit oh, wow. the great Ron Paul, the book he did, and the transcriptions of all the interviews he's done with Ron over the years. Yeah, I helped kind of copy edit that and style and stuff like that to make sure it all looked looked good because it's kind of hard to transcribe interviews onto the page because there's lots of punctuation issues and stuff. And yeah, I'm also helping him with his, uh, his uh, upcoming book, hopefully uh, tentatively titled enough already. The, the Epic about all the terror wars. Yeah. The Epic. And that's his, the Iliad, <laughs> that's his problem. And he admits it. And we talk about it all the time um, that he's got so much and he keeps reading and finding out more stuff. He does. He, he's having a hard time uh, stopping the research and getting back into the writing, but it's going to be great. I've, what I've seen of it so far, it, it's really going to be, uh, and we're, we're trying to, okay, let me ask you this. What would your opinion be? Would you rather have that book be 300 pages or 500 pages? I mean, I'm not the average reader though. So you're going to say 500. I'm going to say 500. No, she was going to suggest a thousand. Yeah. Yeah. yeah because I, I re- read the Silmarillion and right. shrugged and shit for fun. But can you add a few extra footnotes for her? Most people probably yeah. want a shorter book that they can kind of get the idea and move on. Well, I'm biased. I just, I just go, Scott's right. Yeah. Do whatever he says. Yeah. <laughs> can we just talk about music in, in pirate radio, Scott? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But no, he, he, the, the book is going to be great. Oh, I'm sure. He'll, we'll figure it out. He'll, he'll figure out what he wants to do exactly. And we'll, we'll come in at that word count. Well, I mean, he, he's, this guy is writing a gigantic history book about probably the most complicated place in the world. Well, it, but he's, he's not just doing this book is not just, uh, Iraq. It's all the terror war. Well, no, that's what I'm saying. Like I'm, I was just saying the Middle East in oh, general the, Middle East. the okay. most complicated place in the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the Middle East and the United States and and all that. Yeah. So and even he's got a, a chapter planned or, or two about you know Africa, like Libya and Somalia and <sighs> places like that. Jeez. So it, it's amazing what it's so depressing. Here's here's the Lib the Libyan chapter. Yeah. Fuck Hillary Clinton. Well, enough said. The, the, yeah, yeah. See, that was mic drop. Yeah, uh, man. I I, I was. I, I had gone all day without thinking about Hillary Clinton and the other <laughs> Oh, oh, sorry. That's okay. I'm going to continue going. I, I said it. I didn't even think about it. Yeah. So we're good. Stream of consciousness. It was gone before it ever happened. Yeah. So that has been a lot of fun, Aaron. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah. Anything you, else you need to plug? Mention the show one more time. Um, mention the show Decentralized Revolution. It's the Mises Caucus uh, podcast. And if you want to get the, the Mises Caucus emails that I write, sometimes Mike writes the the bulk of it and I kind of switch it around and get it in in the email format but uh most of the you make it look like somebody wasn't on mushrooms when they wrote it yeah basically basically um so you can sign up for for the the email newsletter find out more about the Mises caucus at takehumanaction.com also we we had a money bomb scheduled for late March which we uh postponed because of all the all the C stuff yeah 
I, I, back to the emails real quick. If yeah. you guys write way better emails than the LP, I can tell you that much. I actually, oh, I actually open and read yours as I as I don't with theirs because they suck. It's because I'm doing it, and and I don't know who I don't know who's <laughs> yeah. And they even format they don't. It's not attractive to look at. Yeah, no, but, they're they're awful. Like I don't yeah. like them. I'm telling you right now, your emails are way better. So thank you, thank you. If you can if you can tell the LP to suck dicks, then. You know, I, I <laughs> won't do that, but we'll try. And if we get a new chair in there, maybe, uh, maybe I, I can convince them to let me do theirs. But um, Joe Bishop Henchman, right? That's just who you're going for. Yeah, yeah, JBH all the way. <laughs> so um, no, actually, Joshua Smith. J- just so people know, uh, we're we're giving away when we do the money bomb, which we're not sure when we're going to reschedule it for. But we're giving away a nice little gun there. Yeah, we're giving away an AR-15, some oh, silver nice. rounds, some T-shirts, stuff like that. And you can register to win those things at lpmesiscaucus.com slash money bomb. So you can do that and. Uh, Check out the podcast, Decentralized Revolution. Thanks so much for coming on, Aaron. We're glad to have you. It's fun. Yeah, it's been a blast. Hopefully it wasn't too awkward for you. I realize we're uh, we're a little more different than than many of the other podcasts out there. A little informal. (laughs) I I really liked it. You guys guys are good at what you do. So, all right, boss. You have yourself a good day, man. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks, Nick. Bye-bye. What do you think? I thought that was fabulous. He's a he's a very cool dude. He was a very nice guy. Also, another one of those Ohio people. So we don't have a lot. Yeah, which is always awesome. We're very lonely in this state. <laughs> this state is weird. Things have just gotten weirder here. I just keep getting weirder everywhere, Liz. The world is weird. Yeah, it's true. I don't know how to make heads or tails of it. You want to make it really weird? Mm. You should listen to this three body problem book. Yeah did seem like uh it had some interesting story structures and then it's kind of based in a different culture to begin with so it's got a lot of weird stuff in it yeah i don't know that i think it's a well-written book but it's an interesting book nonetheless <laughs> okay fair enough so is that like like memento it's possibly not as good a movie as it seems like the first time you see it but you know the first time you see it you're like oh i gotta watch that again that was interesting i did not feel that way about memento i was like okay i never need to watch that again <laughs> okay. Pretty. I'm pretty sure I got everything I needed to get out of it. Fair enough. But yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I'll come back to it. Like, like. So this book has a lot of really cool concepts. Mm-hmm. I just don't like think the writing's all that great. It's not immersing me in it in any way. Okay. I'm just trying to get from concept to concept and be okay with that. I see. Interesting. Yeah. But somebody said, hey, it was written by people from China. And I'm like, that sounds pretty, something I should be aware of, if nothing else. Yeah, totally. And it did at least give you something interesting to uh, to check out. So, yeah. That. I, I've been in C.S. Lewis land, like sci-fi C.S. Lewis, which was different than I thought that was going to be. She's like, I didn't even know that was a thing. Right. But uh, yeah, no, good stuff. Right on. Well, any we have anything new coming up? We got. I mean, I, we've got a bunch of interviews. Oh my god, we've got yeah. some super fun stuff coming up. Interview-wise. If you, uh, you know, haven't been following any of Nick's other podcasts, you probably should because we've got some uh, some interesting stuff happening over there. There's interesting stuff happening all over the place. The world is interesting. We are in interesting times. Fuck those Chinese people that came up with that saying because they've they've wished this upon us. Is that? Oh, okay. I didn't realize that was a thing. Have you have you, have you never heard? May you may you live in interesting times. Yeah, no, I've I've never heard that, but yeah, that does seem like a odd thing to say to people. Well, some people take it as meaning a good thing, but as we can see, interesting times are not fun. 
interesting times is not very like specific enough to be like only good. <laughs> yeah, it's real interesting out there. We can say that. <laughs> so I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. But at any rate, we're gonna we're gonna let you folks go. Thanks for hanging out this week. If you want information, stop by peacefreaks.com, spell it whichever way you like, and check out the show notes. And you know, take it easy. Yeah, make it make it magical. This podcast is a proud creation of the Mad Audio Lab. For more information, check out madaudiolab.com. Peace Freaks is part of the Liberty Hippie Podcast Network. If you like what we do, be sure to check out Homesteads and Homeschools, Free Markets Green Earth, Cannabis Heals Me, and This Week in Liberpods. We're living proof that libertarian doesn't mean washed up Republican.